Welcome back to um, Faith Roots, the Faith Roots podcast. Lovely to have you with us. And we're continuing this series of uh, talks looking at the book of 1 Chronicles. Uh, we're at uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 15 today. And uh, you might want to pause the recording, um, uh, the uh, either the, the podcast or the, the video, uh, just to find and to read that Bible passage for yourself, then keep the Bible passage open as we we work through it and see what it is saying. We'll see what's going on in the passage. We'll think about some of the issues, what's um, what it says, what it means. Then we'll start to think about how we apply that to us. What's it got to do with us today? Uh, so here we are in in chapter fifteen, and uh, you will remember from last time. Uh, that King David has attempted to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Uh, that attempt was aborted uh, back in chapter 13. Then we go to chapter 14 and we see that despite the Ark not being with David in Jerusalem, we still see God blessing uh, David uh, because it's not about his works, it's not about uh, his getting things right in terms of obeying the law, a big Bible theme, that theme in the New Testament is there in the Old Testament as well. Uh, God blesses, God gives grace first. And so the Ark of the Covenant, uh, uh, representing God's presence, God's blessing, God's law, but he didn't in a superstitious way need to bring the Ark to guarantee God's blessing. Rather, the presence of the Ark was a reminder that God was already to act him to bless God's people. So the ark still mattered to David. He still wanted it in Jerusalem to symbolise that. Uh, we also get the impression that he's heard about how God is blessing Obed-Edom, who's got the ark with him. And so David decides, yet yeah, we are going to go for a second attempt to go and get the ark. It still matters. It's still important. And so in chapter 15, um, we read about how the ark does eventually come to Jerusalem. First of all, uh, we're told that David is building houses, palaces for himself in uh, what is now being known as the city of David in Jerusalem. It's, it's taken on his name. It's his city now. Um, this begins to show that the, the kingdom is experiencing some prosperity, some peace, some stability. Uh, the war isn't right on David's doorstep. Uh, there's still battles, there's still fights to be won, but uh, they will be happening at the borders as the kingdom expands. Uh, there, there's no danger to, to David. There's not going to be any danger to the Levites as well in Jerusalem. But he also prepares, he's got a house, and he prepares a tent place for the ark uh, uh, to be kept. Uh, so he, he sets aside some space and he puts up a, a tent there. Uh, notice that, that contrast immediately, something that's going to bother David later, uh, that contrast between, between him having a proper permanent house with the sign of proster, prosperity and stability and, and just a, a makeshift tent that gets put up and taken down again, something temporary, something that's going to be of poorer quality than the house. David will be concerned quite a lot about that. We will find out later that God is less concerned. And that's something that we will want to think about, about why God thinks that, but that, that's for later. So there's a place for the tent uh, for, for it to come to. Uh, Incidentally, this is not to be confused with the tabernacle, uh, the, 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 the tent of meeting. Not gone away, that's been uh, there. And we'll find out in uh, chapter to 16 that it's, um, it, it's got a place, uh, not in Jerusalem, a little bit further away where the priests are. different tent used just to keep the ark in. So the sacrifices, the priestly ministry, 
the annual festivals will continue for a while to happen away from Jerusalem. Uh, the Ark is here, going to be here with David. And all sorts of interesting things to think through there about that separation and what the implications are. Has David got it completely right? Or is there a sense of here's something private for me and something public for Israel? All sorts of things we might, we might want to think about, you might want to consider and debate and discuss and pursue in commentaries just to see what you think about it. So there's a house and a tent or houses and tents and uh, David is now ready for the second attempt to go and get the ark back. He then gets the Levites together and he says these are the people, the descendants of Levi, one of the 12 tribes, the same tribe that Aaron, the, the high priest in Moses' time, had been from, the same tribe that supplies the priests. And, and he says only Levites are to carry the ark, uh, no one else. So having had that horrendous experience of... Uh, of uh, Responsible for the ark being struck down by God because they mishandled it, David goes back and sees what the law says. And the Torah, the law in the Pentateuch is very clear that the Levites are to carry the ark. It's not to be put on a on, on a on a trailer to be a cart to be um, pulled around. It's to be carried on poles, and there are specific people responsible for doing that. And, and David says, We got it wrong last time. We didn't listen to God. We didn't follow the law. We were more concerned with the outward appearance of having the ark with us, with this kind of superstitious thing, than paying attention to the words on the tablets of stone in the ark and all that that represented in terms of God speaking, God giving instructions about how he is to be worshipped and honoured. David is realising that worshipping God means coming to him in the way that he tells us to. By the way, for us as Christians, that means it's a non-negotiable. The only way that we come to worship God is through Jesus Christ, through the cross, uh, through the, the, the joy and delight of salvation in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how we come to worship. Well, so David says, only the Levites are to carry it. And then they're told to go and prepare themselves, verse 12 uh, and uh, verse 14. So we're looking at this correction in verse 1 to 15 of what's been happening. And in 12 to 14, David uh, sends, the, uh, sends the, um, the Levites to go and prepare themselves, consecrate themselves, to set themselves aside from distraction, to make sure that their hearts are ready, that they don't become ceremonially unclean, that there's nothing that is contaminating them. And they do that so that in verse 14 they are consecrated and ready to carry the ark. Holiness matters. We can't just approach God as we please. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? It's the one with clean hands. What is it that puts a barrier up to us? Drawing close to God, it's our sin, it's our unholiness, it's our uncleanness. And of course, we as believers have the joy of knowing that we have been made clean, made holy in Jesus Christ. That will also be the concern to live out that holiness in our lives, in our hearts and in our minds, in our words and in our actions. It is now getting it. He says the reason why the Lord broke out against us wasn't that God was wrong, but that we had got it wrong. And so verse 1 to 15 is this correction for what had happened in chapter 13. And so this correction, uh, then there's worship. Look with me at verse 16 to 28. So... David, um, in this section, he gets the Levites to appoint others. So the, uh, there are other members of the tri tribe of Levi, as well as the priests, and as well as those responsible for carrying the ark. And he says, uh, get those that have musical gifts ready. 
get them to raise their voices uh, with joy, accompanied by musical instruments, harps, lyres, and cymbals. Uh, so we've got this list of people that are appointed to do that. Uh, the Levite's responsibility is not just for carrying the ark, also for encouraging the people to join in joyful worship and celebration with music and shouting and dancing. And this is crucial uh, at this stage uh, because from the perspective of the chronicler, the one writing this book, he knows that by the time they get to the other side of the exile, the ark will be gone. That duty of carrying it will no longer be there. Uh, no temple, no sacrifices to offer either, because Jesus will have offered the sacrifice once and for all. But there is a responsibility that, that is broader in worship than carrying boxes. Uh, than um, uh, sacrifices and all that kind of thing uh, that to bear up the ark but to bear up responsibilities as well the ark is temporary worship is permanent and they get to did you notice as well as we look at this section that David is completely, fully immersed in the worship? So look at verse 25. David, the elders of Israel and the commanders of thousands went with rejoicing to bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom. Seven, David was dressed in a robe of fine linen as were all the Levites who were carrying the ark, as well as the singers and Cheraniah, the music leader of the singers. David also the liturgical garments. So all the Israelites, all Israel, brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouts, the sound of the ram's horn, trumpets and cymbals, and the playing of harps and is really well and truly immersed in this as the king is the leader sometimes talk about worship leaders in the church but uh, meaning people responsible for leading the music and the singing but there's a sense in which pastors and elders are worship not that they necessarily have to lead the singing but by their life's attitudes by their approach, by their participating in what is happening in the church, they are setting an example and encouraging the whole church to enjoy God in praise, to enjoy him and glorify him forever. Peter, um, series um, Guy Braun, he says on this, even today we must wonder whether the kind of expression of devotion which gives little attention to worship, also to the formal aspects of worship, has not gone far astray from the mark. <laughs> that there's a question for us. We don't take seriously this delight and joyfulness. We don't have that place for reverence and awe. about. It seems that everybody is caught up in this. They are following the example. They're joining in this great excitement. The ark is brought to Jerusalem. Everybody's praising God. It's a big celebration. It's like a worship service and a party and a parade all joined up together, uh, but not everyone. David is despised, verse 29. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord was entering the city of David. Saul's daughter, Michael, 
looked down from the window and saw King David leaping and dancing and she despised him in her heart. Samuel 6 it gives us a bit more detail uh, it says that David when he goes to meet with her she challenges him she, she rebukes the king uh, she accuses him of lacking dignity that he is undignified that he's exposing himself uh, mockery of himself making a fool of himself and, and David says those famous words that I think got turned into a uh, a worship song back around the turn of the century that if it's about worshipping God he says I will become even more I'm not concerned about my own dignity my own reputation I'm not concerned about how other people see me I'm concerned about allowing my heart to... I shouldn't be concerned about what people think about us but about what God says about us. But we might want to stop and just think about Micah's response. Micah is Saul's daughter. Um, she was David's first wife. Remember that King Saul had promised his daughter in marriage uh, to uh, the champion who would fight for him. Goliath. Uh, David had, to, had to go to extra effort to to win Micah over not loved him at the start she is willing to protect him against Saul uh, but Saul to keep his side of the deal David is in exile on the run from Saul Saul just marries her off again uh, to someone else and then David takes her back when he returns as, as king. And that might leave us asking the question, who is in the wrong here? Is Micah completely wrong or do we have any sympathy for her? People have pointed out that here is this lady and if she despises her husband and her king, she has some excuse. Is this a rebellious heart or a broken heart? Certainly being just treated like a, a chattel, like or to be passed around, not treated with dignity and value and respect. Her dad had been happy to use her as a reward to attract people to fight for him when he was too much of a coward to fight himself. Being willing just to pass her on to someone else. David, he hadn't taken her with him. Uh, that's perhaps understandable. Experience some sense of abandonment. Comes up back and he takes her back as his wife, but he's already been marrying other people in the meantime and he adds to her his family. So rather than being the queen, and rather being the, the focal point of David's love and devotion, she competes and she seems to just be down the pecking order. have some sympathy for her and understand. So there is one side of the story there. I think that it is legitimate to consider that. Is, at, is, is David at fault? What about might have some sympathy, we might understand where she's coming from and what has contributed to that. 
she despises God's anointed king and she despises him at the very point when he's worshipping despises him when the ark is coming back should be understood corporate not only did she despise David but also uniquely in Israel she was out of sympathy with the great joy and concern over the ark the relation of Saul's daughter was a further demonstration of Saul's house's failure to lead the people of God So this is a symbol of the failure of Saul's house and personal issues have been allowed to affect her worship and her connection to God's people so she ended up isolated. Uh, we know from 2 Samuel that she ends up barren as well. She's without children, another mark of the end of Saul's household. It suggests that she is wrong here. For us, we can both sympathize and understand when people have been hurt, uh, those emotions. To become bitter. God, to despise God's people, as well to despise Christ and the gospel, and to become isolated. Oh, we have a responsibility not to present the opportunity and the occasion for that to become but we also have the responsibility to challenge people and their hearts to encourage them to get to that right place with god and with his people so what is going on here well i think there's two things that we can pick up let's see david as the better king than Saul. So, like it says that David seeks, he seeks God. Saul does not. David and Saul's daughter despises David's celebration, continuing in the tradition of her neglectful father. She was barren. Mark So David again is seen as the king who seeks God, who takes care of the worship. All tied up together while Saul and his family are seen despising God, despising worship, despising the ark. Is what Saul had done. So he's better than Saul, but he is also a new Moses. There's a, a David. And David is the leader who delivers God's people from the danger, danger of enemies. It brings them out of the slavery that they've been under uh, to the Philistines, defeating them. Brings them to God's place, the, the city of peace, to Jerusalem, just as... Moses had brought the people up to the land of Canaan. It also encourages the people to worship God. So just as Moses had prepared uh, uh, the time. So David has these symbols of worship restored and encourages the people, reminds them to go back to God's law and not just the symbols, but to obey God's word, to listen to God's voice. Uh, of course all of these are stepping stones. If David is a better Saul and a better Moses, uh, we've all 
this piece about the warning signs, even in this chapter, even in the good things here, he's not the complete package yet. A better Saul, a better David to come. Uh, David puts us forward to King Jesus, the one who rescues us, delivers us from slavery, delivers us from our enemy, sin, Satan, death into God's presence so that we can worship him. Some things to think about as you discuss with others and seek to apply 1 Chronicles 15 to your context, to yourself, your family, your life group, your home group, your church. Again, should we sympathise with Michael? Is she a sympathetic character in the story? Is there a danger of us being suspicious of large Christian projects and of events where people talk about God speaking to them or concerned about what happens at Christian events? Is there a danger there that we could fall into the trap that Michael did? It's in God. us to Christ in this chapter. I've enjoyed looking at this Bible passage with you. I hope you've enjoyed working through it.